I'm going to start out with sort of a, a, a fairly broad question, but in your mind, what makes a great movie monster? Uh, an element of surprise, an element of suspense. You know, I can't wait for the movies to be reopened so that people can once again engage in that social experiment of being in a dark room and everybody participating in the same scare factor and you know, tingly, it's a roller coaster ride. I like to think of it as, you know, you're approaching the top of the precipice and then all of a sudden you're, and you're suddenly turning left or right or right back into your living room. So and you're, you're screaming and you're laughing and you're feeling all the emotions. It's a sense of, you know, uh, eternal joy, I think. I think people love to be scared. They love the unknown. As long as they know on the other side of it, they're going to return home, right? And have their own popcorn. So that's it. And horror films have always traditionally saved Hollywood from itself. You look at the great universal films of the 30s, Frankenstein, Dracula, The Mummy, uh, you know, they all rescued Hollywood from obscurity. So I think when we all get through this pandemic time, that we're going to have a host of uh, great stories, I'm sure, percolating in screenwriters' brains as we speak. I think so, too. Well, you know, for every Candyman, uh, a character that is created and sticks in our mind for decades and doesn't go anywhere. There are a lot of movie monsters that sort of come and go and they don't really make a splash and then we tend to kind of forget about them. So what is the difference between a, a, a character that is created and, and sticks in the world of pop culture and one that just doesn't really connect with people? Well, I think uh, the original Candyman was based on a short story called uh, The Forbidden and uh, Clive Barker's great work. Then Bernard Rose, who directed the original Candyman, had the genius to transpose it to Chicago. So he made a story that went from Liverpool to Chicago in, a, in the middle, you know, America is still in its growth spurts. So I think the story of Candyman resonated when it first came out with the racial history of America. And now I know with everything that's going on in our world between the pandemic and innocent uh, black men being shot uh, needlessly and there's no, not being a call for social reform that this new version is going to resonate even stronger and, uh, and deeper than before. You know, our country was built on, on injustices, you know, for as great as we are as a country, as magnificent opportunities as we have, we still have some backward thinking that hopefully this horror film will address. You're absolutely right. I, I do want to, since I'm talking to you from Chicago, I do want to mention, um, you know, obviously a lot of people love, uh, Chicago loves you, but, yeah. uh, you know, and you know, uh, Cabrini Green is a massive part of Chicago history. Yes. And, uh, you know, while, you know, Candyman is a very fun horror movie, it mm -hmm. says a lot about that era of Chicago. And I, I'm assuming based on what I've seen from the trailers, that the new film is going to say a lot about what has happened to that area in yeah. Chicago. Because, you know, the thing about ghosts, they never go away. And Candyman is a spiritual ghost. He's a ghost that belongs to the collective history and the collective nightmare of America. So there's no way that we can uh, extinguish that flame. And, uh, you know, Chicago, when we, Bernard and I, Bernard Rose, when we first met, we met in Chicago at one of my favorite places, Kingston Mines on Halstead. And I remember blues was raging. There were two bars going on too. And he's talking to me about the value and the internistic opportunities of candy man i said bernard listen to the damn music we're in chicago <laughs> excuse me let that fill your soul and uh you know they move forward so you know candy man is rooted in chicago forever whether there is a physical cabrini green or not the ghosts and the memories and the uh slave-like conditions will always remain you mentioned uh, racial injustices, and what I have always found fascinating about the horror genre is that it's been a really great vessel to tell bigger societal stories. You go all the way back to, you know, Night of the Living Dead and what George Romero, Romero, Romero did, what you guys did um, with Candyman, what Jordan Peele is doing now. Why do you think the horror genre has such an innate capability to tell bigger it's not just making having fun and scaring people it has the capacity to tell bigger more important stories well the more adventurous the filmmaker is the more they'll 
quickly, succinctly seize on that and show that, you know, you can show a simple scar on a man's hand and it can just be an inch long. But if the camera focuses on it and goes deep into the, 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 the veins, and then we understand. Remember when we were kids, we used to have those echo skeletons we used to play with, which would be invisible and all the veins would be showing. A horror film is like that. It makes the viewer look at a situation that they once perceived as being normal. And, you know, you look at the original uh, Halloween, it's shrubbery, it's suburbs. And uh, all of a sudden, a, a new fear is exposed, a genuine fear, not a, not a fake fear like some politicians try to dangle, but something that's truly disturbing. You know, I, I want to talk about, you're, you're fortunate in that Candyman was, was able to speak. Like, we, we learn about him, who he was as a person, that we yeah. learn because he's able to communicate, but there's still a physicality that you created, the, the, just the way that you walk, the way that you sort of, the way that you move. How do you develop not just who he was, his backstory because of the words that he's able to talk about, how do you develop the physicality of the monster? Well, another great thing about him is that you could clearly see his face. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't masked, it wasn't hidden. Um, you know, again, I come from the theater, so I learned how to, the first thing you learn about a character is how does he stand, how does he walk? You know, everybody walks differently. And I knew he was regal, I knew he was tall, I knew he was haunting. And I just filtered those things into my personal DNA and let it loose. And also ah, I think yes. his voice was a major part of who he was. It had to resonate, it had to uh, be commanding, it had to draw you in, it had to have a hint of seduction. Mm -hmm. so. It's, it's so interesting. I, sometimes I feel like the best monsters, even though they're terrifying and there's the risk of death, there's a part of me that like, I want them to like me. Like yeah. if I were to me, like I would, I would want him to like think I was a cool guy. You got to think of monsters are the kids in high school that everybody ignored. They couldn't fit in. They didn't belong to any particular group. They had their own way of dealing with the, the, the monotony of schoolwork. So, but they weren't bullies, you know? Mm -hmm. They didn't, they didn't, you know, they did not disturb them. <laughs> There's a great uh, moment in Candyman where the idea is presented that, oh, they just created the idea of Candyman to deal with their own issues. They've got their own issues going on over there, so they've created this sort of fictional urban legend. Why do you think we as a society are so drawn to and create Candyman and Freddy well, and Jason? You know, from, 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 I mean, we weren't around when allegedly we lived in caves, but from what I've learned in history that we've always tried to explain our circumstances. We always left cave drawings around to explain to the, the next generation the, the tribulations that we've gone through as a society. So, you know, I, I think we're drawn to things that we don't understand. We're always our curiosity at Christmas time, and I'm sure you had great Christmases growing up. We 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 said the toys we wanted, but we were happy with the things we got. At least if we were grateful people, you know. You're absolutely right. I I want to talk about when you're a, a day on set, when it's a death day, when you're going to kill someone. What is what is that day like for you as an actor? Well, I I don't look forward to harming anybody you know i grew up an only kid so those aren't necessarily easy days for me i struggle with the kills you know which is what i think makes him a little different uh and, and in candy man's case he was always searching for his unrequited love mm -hmm. so if you were in the way of that you know you had to suffer the consequences mm -hmm. and the new one it goes even deeper into sense of longing and lost and you know and presents new questions about who is Candyman, why does Candyman exist, who could possibly become him. You, you've intrigued me, but I haven't seen the new film. I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, if the world were normal, I would have seen it by now, but I, you, yeah, you've right? intrigued me as the direction that we're, you know, I'm yeah, hoping to do the you, junket, so. You've seen the trailers, so yeah. uh, we have a nice feministic, uh, artistic slant on, mm -hmm. on a retelling of a story mm -hmm. that will forever remain in American history. The director that you guys have, I am so excited to see yeah. all the directions that she is yeah. gonna go. Oh, I'm, I'm so thrilled for her. Was there a moment that you knew 
that Candyman wasn't just going to be a role that you played and the people ended up, you know, maybe forgot, like, like that everyone will always know who Candyman is. Well, when well, did you know that? I, I didn't know it until two years after the film came out. You know, originally it wasn't necessarily a hit. It was received, but then cable came along. And I remember shopping with my daughter, Ariana, uh, Christmas, and for the first time, people were coming up to us and saying, oh, this and, 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 uh, and it was an awakening for me because I had to be a family person first. And I remember her throwing her little bags down and saying, that's not Candyman, that's my dad. And that moment was forever uh, an anchor for me in my growth as an actor and as a father and a human being. So you learn how to separate. I'm, I'm happy that the film has sustained interest to people all over the world. You know, but at the same time, I know how to separate and be a father, be a human being, and just be gracious. I mean, the work keeps coming, and I have to be receptive to that. Absolutely. Speaking of separating yourself, mm -hmm. even though you are Candyman, can you sit down, watch the film, and be scared? Like, are you scared of Candyman? Well, I'm scared of the storytelling. I'm mm -hmm. always... I, I go to any film, whether I'm in it or not, with a sense of an anticipation and a sense of joy. You know, my my memory of movies is, you know, borrowing a dollar from my grandmother, going into a dark theater, seeing something like Bonnie and Clyde uh, with Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway and saying, oh, my God, I got to stay here and watch this again. You know, it's like a great comic book, a great graphic novel. I love that. I love that. You know, I, I began our interview by telling you that I grew up watching these films at a very young age. And sometimes I tell people that and they go, what were you doing watching those <laughs> movies? Uh, my, my, my parents say all the time, you were either going to end up being a film critic or you're going to end up a psycho. Like one, like one, or, one or the other. Oh, um, oh, yeah. Well, depending <laughs> on who you talk to, I got a couple of exes out there that might have uh, some thoughts on that. Same but I, what, what is it like when someone tells you, like I, I grew up watching, I grew up watching that movie. Uh, it used to bother me. I used to tell people, you know, we didn't make the film for seven year olds. And increasingly people said, oh yeah, I was five, I was six, I was seven. Mm -hmm. And I went to Bernard, I said, Bernard, what's going on? And he says, Tony, relax. Anybody that saw this film at a young age will remember it forever. And apparently that's what's going on. And mm -hmm. I'm proud of that legacy. I've carried this character with me for 30 years, going to different conventions, signing autographs, action figures etc cetera, etc cetera. and now all of a sudden it's come full circle well because it's it's so relevant now like I, that's it's just it almost seems more relevant now than 30 years ago i think there will be images in the new film that will shake people to their soul it, it redefines what horror it, the word horror is you know we think of it as slasher and scary you know modern horror urban yes. horror which is where it should belong because if you know the purpose of film or theater is to present a mirror to society and show yeah. people elements about their own psyche mm -hmm. in the experience hopefully not too many people truly identify with serial killers mm -hmm. they want to see all the reasons why they shouldn't become the thing that they're most afraid of absolutely you know one of the uh things that goes along with horror movie monsters are sequels. The fact that we ended up getting to revisit the character years after year. Uh, I know you've done a handful, not nearly as many as, you know, the Jasons and the Freddies out there, but what are the upsides and the downsides of returning to a character like this? Well, I guess if you've done a character once, you sort of know the codes, you know, you know, the, the cues, the psychic, you know, clothes hangers that you're supposed to deal with. I think uh, one of the things, that the, the dangers, it can become monotonous. You know, unless the script is worth the weight of the character's existence, you mm -hmm. just stay away from it. Because then you're just, you know, I mean, look at the trajectory of Jaws, for example. The first Jaws is incredible. It, it, it opened up the whole blockbuster experience. But with each subsequent one, it gets, and forgive the analogy, it becomes more watered down. So <clears throat> you got to be careful with that. Unless so I got to say, Candyman 2 and 3 are infinitely better films than Jaws 2, 3, and 4. Well, well we made some mistakes with that. I, I wish I had stayed away from the third one, but we're going to redeem all that with this, mm -hmm. with, I don't want to say new or old or reworked or retelling, but whatever it's called, the Candyman movie, 
and uh, and I think it'll be worth the the time we spend apart from each other. You know, uh, whenever the first word got out that the new Candyman was coming out, mm-hmm. there was a massive fan sort of moment because we didn't know if you were coming back. Right. And I, I hope you take it as a compliment that everyone sort of felt like, well, if he's not coming back, then what's the point? Because a lot of times these roles end up being recast. Would you? I know. You, I know you are back. What, would you ever be comfortable uh, with someone hold else playing on. this? So let's, let's give people a sense of mystery. We don't know whether I'm back or not. As a matter of fact, we don't know if I ever left. Okay, so I'll just leave it like that. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Okay, so then, so then, let me ask: Would you be comfortable with with anyone else ever playing this role? You know, it's like theater. Uh, you take a great Shakespearean play like Othello or uh, Hamlet. You know, it's been interpreted a thousand different ways in a thousand different theaters with great acclaim. Any great role can be interpreted by many actors, you know, and, and, and each actor can bring out a new sense of truth, you know, mm-hmm. as, long as, as long as the actor is, has the chops and is doing their job, then it's a, it's a sense of honor. <laughs> Well, we're going, we don't need roads.